I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that clear anybody to see I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not Welcome to Brains Matter. This is episode 14 for the 25th of January 2007. I'm the ordinary guy. And I'll bring you stories on science, curiosities, knowledge, and anything else that's interesting. On today's show, you hear about Comet McNaught, the brain teaser, a bit about calendars and time, pin of the week, some listener feedback, and I'll bring you some of the latest news in the world of knowledge. I'm running a bit late this week with putting the podcast out. That's because I was comet chasing. Not literally, but as many of you know, and I've mentioned it on a previous show, Comet McNaught, or C2006P1, is currently visible to people on Earth. I went to the top of Mount Dandenong, which is on the outskirts of Melbourne, with a couple of friends, and hoped that it wasn't too cloudy and that we could see the comet that evening. It's usually not very crowded up on the top of the mountain, but Tuesday night was the busiest I've seen it for as long as I can remember. People were setting up their tripods with their cameras and telescopes, and families were up there with their children to see this once-in-a-lifetime spectacle. I took my camera with me, as did my friends, and you can see a couple of examples of what I saw from up there in the show notes on the website. I'm no professional photographer, but you get the basic idea. The comet actually looks fantastic through a pair of good binoculars, and the tail was much, much longer than I thought it would be. Observers can see the comet with the naked eye, and it's actually quite bright. A few people were confused on Tuesday, thinking that Mercury was the comet, but the fact that Mercury didn't have a tail gave it away. It appeared in the southwest around about 9.30pm or so, so about half an hour after sunset. It stayed visible until almost 10.30pm, at which point it had retreated beyond the horizon. The comet is quite close to the sun at the moment, in astronomical terms anyway, and the solar wind is blowing dust and gas off the comet, causing it to appear to have a very long tail. The comet was discovered by Robert McNaught, an amateur astronomer based in Coonabarabran in Australia, who discovered it in August last year. He's actually found around 32 comets in a 20-year time span. McNaught is the brightest comet in 40 years, and much brighter than Halley's Comet in 1986, which ended up being a disappointment after all the hype in the mainstream press about that event. They say that Comet McNaught will disappear in a few days, so try and see it now if you can, because then it'll head out to the outer solar system and might not be back for a few million years. If you've managed to see or photograph Comet McNaught, drop me a line. Post your picture up in the comments section for the episode, or let me know what you saw and what you thought. And now it's time for today's brain teaser. Who's actress Ilyina Vasilevna Mironov, better known as? The answer to that, later in today's show. You may remember a few episodes ago, I talked about where the months got their names. The current months generally got their names from Roman times, but where did the Romans get their concept of the calendar? Why use 12 months? 
why have seven days in a week? They seem to be quite random apart from the fact that we know that it takes around 365 days for the Earth to orbit the Sun. We know that a month generally coincides with how long the Moon takes to revolve around the Earth, but other measurements such as the number of days in a week, or weeks in a month, don't seem to follow any environmental or astronomical cues. The ancestors of the current calendar we use, or the Gregorian calendar, is actually the Babylonian calendar, which is a calendar used over 3,500 years ago. The months were lunar, as you'd expect, and the new month would begin on the evening when the crescent of the new moon was first visible. The day started in the evening at dusk, and this is a tradition that survives today in Islam and Judaism with their traditional timekeeping. We'll see what's common to both in a minute. The names of the various months varied a bit, but the most popular names were those that were used in the Nippur region which is near modern-day Baghdad in Iraq. These names were used in Babylonia, then Assyria, and when the Babylonians annexed Jerusalem in 586 BC, this same calendar was then used by the Jewish people. The Jewish names also descend from Babylonian names. The names of the months were Nisanu, Ayaru, Simanu, Duza, Abu, Ululu, Tashritu, Arasamnu, Kislimu, Tibetu, Shabatu, and Adaru. You'll see that they've got quite a similarity of the Jewish names. For example, Nisanu becomes Nisan, Ayaru becomes Iyar, Ululu becomes Elul, Shabatu becomes Shevat, and Adaru becomes Adar. And now it's time for the answer to the brain teaser. Irina Vasilevna Mironov is better known as the actress Helen Mirren. Now it's time for the Pin of the Week. Today's Pin of the Week goes to Ray from Sydney, Australia. Thanks for adding to the Frapper Map, and I hope you're enjoying the show. If you want to be part of Pin of the Week, it's easy. Just put a pin into the Frapper Map with your name and location, which is listed on the website, and you automatically become eligible. So what's been happening in the world of knowledge lately? Reports from NASA indicate that the Cassini spacecraft has found mountains on Titan, the tallest seen on the satellite, which is a range of about 150 kilometers, is about 30 kilometers wide and 1.5 kilometers high. This isn't that tall compared to the tallest mountains on Earth, but given the size of Titan, they are very large. You may recall a little while ago a news article in the papers and on TV about higher IQs being linked to vegetarianism. Studies from the Southampton University show that people who became vegetarian by the age of 30 had, on average, a 5 IQ point advantage at the age of 10 than those who ate meat by the age of 30. Of course, the benefits of a vegetarian diet have been studied, discussed and known for thousands of years. A few of the reports in the media appear to imply that vegetarians are smarter, in the sense that those who only eat vegetarian food are smarter as a result of being vegetarian. What the studies show don't actually imply this, 
although it doesn't actually disprove this either. What the study shows is that those who are smarter are more likely to become vegetarians later in life if they aren't vegetarian already. Liz O'Neill from the Vegetarian Society in the UK said, We've always known that vegetarianism is an intelligent, compassionate choice benefiting animals, people and the environment. The researchers also claimed that the findings also show that those who were more likely to turn to vegetarianism not only showed higher IQs but had better education and higher social class. The lead researcher, Catherine Gale, said of the results, The finding that children with greater intelligence are more likely to report being vegetarian as adults, together with the evidence on the potential benefits of a vegetarian diet on heart health, may help to explain why higher IQ in childhood or adolescence is linked with a reduced risk of coronary heart disease in adult life. She also said, People who are more intelligent as children who will obviously keep that intelligence when they are 30 were more likely to say that they are vegetarian at that age than those who are less intelligent. The implication is that those who are more intelligent tend to eat a healthier diet. The study shows that for every 15 point increase in IQ, the probability of being vegetarian rose another 38%, even adjusting for other factors that I'd already mentioned. So there you have it. Smarter kids are less likely to die of heart attacks. And this may be because of the dietary lifestyles that they choose. According to a report from the United Nations, 2% of the adults in the world own more than half of all worldwide wealth. The report was produced by the World Institute for Development Economics Research at the UN University and also makes the startling discovery that the poorer half of the world only own 1% of the world's wealth. The survey was taken in 2000 and it would be even worse today. These are some quite worrying statistics. Joseph Stieglitz, a Columbia University professor who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2001, recently wrote a report that shows that, despite what the governments tell us, if you take into account the hidden costs, the war in Iraq is going to cost the US alone somewhere between $1 trillion and $2 trillion. $2 trillion! Imagine if even a fraction of that money was used to help those in the Middle East to research alternative energy sources and to generally make the world a better place. Those in impoverished conditions would have someone to be thankful to and have a real difference made to their lives, and the rest of us wouldn't have to rely on a finite energy resource for too much longer. Imagine that! You may remember back in episode 7 and 8, a discussion around the Vedic people and religions and the fact that the swastika isn't, in reality, a Germanic symbol. Well, in Germany there is a current move to ban the swastika across the whole of the European Union. This move is being opposed by Hindu groups because the swastika, or Suvasati, is an ancient religious symbol of peace. The German members of the EU are trying to claim that the swastika is solely a Nazi symbol and therefore want to outlaw it, without considering the fact that the Hindus have been using the symbol for over 5,000 years. And you might even remember from episode 8 that Michael Feller also explained that the Jews used the swastika in their tombs in early times. Ironic, isn't it? Ramesh Khalidi of the Hindu Forum of Britain said, it's almost like saying that the Ku Klux Klan used burning crosses to terrorise black men, so therefore, let us ban the cross. How does that sound to you? Well, Ramesh, considering that the Nazis also used the cross, it sounds about as valid as trying to ban the swastika to me. Let's hope that common sense prevails. Thanks to Peter T who left a comment about episode 12 on the website. Peter writes, 
Hi, Ordinary Guy. I'm writing in response to some reader feedback which question the nature of brain potential and whether or not we use more than 10% of its capacity. You answered it appropriately, but I thought I'd contribute some extra information for curiosity's sake. This is one of the most well-known brain myths around the world, but its origins aren't clearly identified. Responsibility is often dumped on our poor friend Einstein, but truthfully, he never once suggested nor supported this notion. The only thing he is guilty of is knowing that most people don't apply themselves very well or concentrate as much as they should. The rumour probably came from the 19th century pseudoscience, where phrenologists claimed that the brain is localised and therefore there must be large portions that are nothing more than, ment- than the mental equivalent of fairy floss. This was because, at the time, they thought the lumpy bits of brain were well exercised and the less lumpy bits were untrained and underused. Nowadays, the myth is last, largely purported by psychics, who use it in their age-old argument that the only difference between us and them is we have learned to use the other 90%. This is not to downplay or discredit believers of ESP, but it begs the question that since this argument has been scientifically lugged, what's the next stance that they'll take? It's also a widely acclaimed expression of Scientologists who printed it in a number of their public display brochures and then tried to hide their embarrassed red faces by going very quiet on the matter. They no longer use the argument currently, but even so, L. Ron Hubbard, who's one of Scientology's big names, was a hard and fast believer of this myth, who borrowed it from controversial psychologist William James, who claimed that it was simply received wisdom from someone who, I suppose, was involved with 19th century phrenologists whose only mean of discerning facts was by touching the skulls of lots of dead people. Likewise, though, it's ludicrous to suggest that we use 100% of our brain 100% of the time. Chemistry aside, it's only logical to conclude that we'd burn out quickly under such conditions. Currently, techniques such as EEGs, MRI scans, cerebral blood flow measures, etc., have shown conclusively that the once-labeled silent cortex of our brain is anything but. More more accurately, it's simply responsible for more subtle activities, such as aspects of our imagination and personality. Thanks for that feedback, Peter. It was very interesting and illuminating. And if you have any feedback on any episodes, you can comment on the episode at the website or send me an email. Thank you once again for listening to the Brains Matter podcast for the 25th of January 2007. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, Please keep that email rolling in at mail at brainsmatter.com. We'll leave a comment on this episode's show notes at www.brainsmatter.com. And make sure you let me know where you're from and how you found the podcast. Music on today's show comes courtesy of Podsafe Audio, and you can find the podcast by doing a search within iTunes or by subscribing manually by clicking one of the links on the website. Please leave comments and vote for the podcast in iTunes and Podcast Alley. If you already voted last month, be sure to vote this month as well. Oh, and thanks for your vote and comment, Shane, in Perth. For those who use dig.com, you can also dig the podcast in the new podcast section. Either click on dig on the Brains Matter website, or go to dig.com and then click on podcasts once you've logged in. Do a search for Brains Matter, and then click on dig. Dig is still being quite buggy at the moment, so not all individual episodes are appearing on the dig.com website you can still dig the podcast overall. And from this episode onwards, I'll put a transcript of the show onto the website so you can read that before, after, or even during a show if you find that useful. I'll leave you with a quote from Evan Esar. Statistics the only science that enables different experts using the same figures to draw different conclusions. I hope you enjoyed the show. 
Bye for now. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that clear anybody to see. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I clever I would be. I'm not half as clever as me.